So good afternoon. Um, we're going to call the uh, Victoria County uh, Municipal Council meeting for June 23rd to order. Uh, our apologies for starting a little late. Uh, one of our presenters, Mr. Bain, was delayed on his way to the deck this afternoon, so uh, we had to delay the start, but he's here now, so we're, we're good to go. Uh, I just want to reference to a couple of things just before we do start. Uh, we've received regrets from Councillor Oregon and also from Councillor McLeod. They are not available this evening. So uh, we do have uh, six of eight councillors, so we have a quorum. Uh, the other thing that I wish to mention that uh, we'd like to acknowledge this meeting is being held on Unamagi, one of seven traditional districts of the Mi'kmaq people and the ancestral unceded area. Um, sorry, the unceded and territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So the agenda has been circulated to you. Are there any error, error additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Uh, if we have not, then we will uh, like to have a motion to approve the agenda as circulated. It's been moved by the deputy warden. Do we have a seconder, please? Second. Seconded by Councilor McNeil. All in favor? All right. Contrary minded. Thank you. And uh, we also want to just note that we have different seating selection tonight. So um, we've changed things up a little bit and uh, hopefully everybody can hear um, the uh, conversation tonight, both from the presenters and from council themselves. So with that, our first uh, presenter this evening, our first guest is uh, the director of the Eastern District Planning Commission, uh, Mr. John Bain, He's no stranger to council. We welcome to Victoria County Council, John, and uh, you have some business with us tonight, so we'll turn it over to you. And John, I'll have to turn your mic on. And I'll remind it for everyone. Green light. Um, thank you, Warden. And again, my apologies for being being late. Um, the the summer traffic is on. on this. Um, so, what I've got uh, to present to you tonight is a a increase in building permit fees. Uh, for your information, this increase was approved by the board. And is also being approved by Inverness, Richmond, and Anaganich counties last week, and um, Port Hawkesbury Council uh, Tuesday night, and Anaganich Town Council uh, Monday night. So you're the last um, council that I'm, I'm presenting this to. Uh, building permit fees have not been increased for 10 years. And the way that we calculate building permit fees presently is based on the square footage, a, a 16 cents per square foot for your building permit fee. And what that has meant is that as the cost of construction has increased, the permit fee as the percentage of the total value of that construction has decreased. It's gone from, if you were using 100, uh, dollars per square foot for construction about 10 years ago. The permit fee at that point was 0.18% of the total cost of construction. And today, if you're using $255 per square foot, it's decreased to 0.07% of the total cost of construction. If you read today's Oren, you'll notice that um, they quoted a, a number of $13 per inspection, which is what uh, they had put in the paper. Now that was that was a little bit um, well. It looked favorable to me, but but, but the the example I was using because I, before I went to uh, Inverness County, I got a call from a builder in Richmond County who uh, was building some cottages, building three cottages, twenty four by twenty four, and um, his designer is his architect uh, said to him you better get your permits in before july 1st because the permit fees are jumping and uh, i said well what how big are the cottages he said 24 by 24 so 24 by 24 
a 500 and so, so at an, an admittedly small cottage, 575, 76 square feet, the permit for that right now is, a, is 92 bucks. And we do seven inspections on that. It doesn't matter that it's a small cottage, you still do the full set of seven inspections. So in the Oren, that, that uh, $13 per inspection that they quoted um, was relative to a very small cottage, but still that's, um, that's $13 per inspection on, on a tiny cottage. Uh, under the new provisions, that 576 square foot building, we would, uh, so we're moving from per square footage to value of construction. And what we're using for value of construction is an industry standard for constructing a customized single family dwelling in the Halifax area, the low end of that. So $255 was last year, $260 this year. There, it's in the report, but the, um, the uh, cost per construction in that uh, Altus Group Canadian Cost Guide is between $255 per square foot to $505 per square foot. My uh, inspectors are telling me that uh, construction around the area is about $300. $325 per square foot. So the using that industry guide for a value of construction will remove people just giving me a guess on how much it's gonna cost them to construct the building. Um, however, if they do have a contracted price, if they give me a price that this is what, what I'm contracting the price to, well, we would permit off of the value of that permit. Um, so the number that we were talking about, so in the staff report, there's a typo. In the staff report, it talks about $2.50 per, $2.50 per thousand dollars of construction value. That's on the third paragraph on the second page. So at the board, we had, um, talked about $3, we talked about $2, we talked about $2.50, I had wanted $2.50, and um, the, the agreement at the board level was $2 per, per uh, $1,000 of construction value. By way of comparison, town of Lunenburg, that's what they use, town of Bridgewater uses $3 per $1,000 of construction value. Presently, uh, our permit fees are approximately in the middle of what other municipalities are charging. Uh, this change will move us up a little bit. If, if you take HRM out, right? If you, because HRM skews that curve. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you put it in, we're, we're back down to the, um, the middle of the, the pack basically based on a weighted average. So I wouldn't count HRM as equivalent to one municipality. I would, doing a weighted average, as you would know, you would take 50% of the whole population of the province and, and weight it for Halifax to do that weighted average. Um, but, the, uh, but that's where we are. We're in about the, about the middle. Um, the intermunicipal agreement that all of our municipal units have uh, signed on to, um, it, it stated that the uh, permit fees are something that are, are established by the commission. So we established the, the permit fees and then the councils have to make a decision whether or not you're gonna adopt my fees or pay the difference. So one, there was one time on what it was 10 years ago when we did an increase in our fees at that point, Richmond County decided that they would be um, opting out of that. And for a number of months, they paid the difference on those permit fees. Now, that didn't last long. Their uh, finance person <laughs> had, had concerns with that. But it, but it is 
your right now, given the, the fees relative to the cost of construction and the service provided, um, is being subsidized by your general rate. People who are not building through the tax rate and through your uh, contribution to the commission, they are, they are subsidizing the cost of doing those inspections. Um, for a motion like this to pass at my board, I need a, a, well, actually anything that happens at the commission, as far as a motion, I need a majority, but I also need a vote from each municipality. So to pick on Richmond again, if Richmond at the board level had, had voted against it, this I wouldn't be here tonight. It would have it would have failed at the board level, but the motion at the board level was unanimous. All of the municipal units uh, agreed that the um, permit fee should be should be increased. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. The uh, the amending page is on the on the back of your report, and the. Um, The recommended motion is on the bottom of the second page. All right, I'm, I'm, we can open it up to any questions. John, uh, does anybody have any questions in regards to the increase of fees as and services as uh, indicated by uh, Director Bain? Okay, so would you just, uh, for those of us that don't have that uh, motion right in front of us right now, would you be kind enough to read that out, sure. please? Um, I have the Inverness County motion in front of me. Well, if it's similar wording, you're not to worry, just give us an indication of. Yeah, so that the Council of the Municipality of the County of Victoria, in accordance with Section 491C2, which states uh, that Council may make policy. So you can do this by policy as opposed to a bylaw amendment. It's not, it's not something that needed to be advertised as a bylaw amendment. It's a policy amendment by policy. Uh, setting and amending the fees to be paid for an inspection required or conducted pursuant to a bylaw of the municipality or an enactment. Adopt the attached fee structure, of, structure effective July 1st, 2020. And we have, we have received that. I have it here, our copy. We just didn't have it physically here. So that is the, uh, that is the motion that uh, is required for us to uh, make those changes with the Planning Commission. Do we have uh, uh, somebody that wishes to make that motion? Just a question first. Sure. John, I may have missed it, but you mentioned that the cottages you were talking about uh, at present Firm that would cost ninety-two dollars based on the system it's done now. Well, yep. What would the uh, the new fee be? So, so the new fee uh, would be two hundred and nine. So it, it's a percentage-wise, it's a big jump, but it's still at two hundred and ninety dollars on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar cottage, which would be how much that little cottage would cost. Uh, still works out to be about forty bucks an inspection. And we're there seven times, or well, we can we can double up on some of our our inspections, but sometimes we're actually called back to do more. Like somebody might be ready to do uh, pre drywall on the on the basement or on the first floor, but the second floor is not ready yet, and they want to get into the bottom before they do the top. But footings in place, subfloor plumbing, subfloor and foundation insulation. So those two can sometimes be done at the same time. Pre-backfill, framing, roof, plumbing, and mechanical systems, insulation and vapor barrier. And then before, yeah, insulation and vapor barrier before the wall framing is covered and then a, and final inspection before occupancy. So just one more thing. Sure. Uh, we require you to have a building permit if you're constructing, right? Whether it's municipality or district planning or whatever. We have a bylaw probably, do we? You have a bylaw, yeah. that's right. I know Nova Scotia Power will not hook you up to the power grid unless you have a building permit. That's correct. correct? What about banks? 
What if you're getting a mortgage? Do banks require that you have a uh, permit? So banks, uh, it's a bit of a contentious issue because banks used to send their own inspectors out to do in inspections on the, on how complete the, um, the uh, construction is. And so sometimes the banks are trying to get in contact with us to, to, for us to give them their uh, inspection records, but we're not doing inspections for banks. We're doing inspections for the, um, the homeowner to protect their investment, uh, not to protect the investment of the banks. But if the homeowner wants to pass those over to the bank, they, they, they do. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, it's not, uh, if you're building a home and you're financing it through a bank, the bank will want to see your inspections. And, and actually, before you get your last drawdown on your mortgage, they want to see the occupancy, which, which again causes some difficulty because they're, they're running on a line of credit, typically. They've got everything finished and they want to get the occupancy so that they can get their last drawdown to pay off their lines of credit. And, and, um, and so we're conscious of that and we try to accommodate that and get that inspection done. But sometimes there's situations where you have an unsafe situation. So they got to, the deck isn't on, the landscaping isn't done, right? So we give it with conditions. Um, but yes, so the short answer, that was the long answer. The short answer is if you're building and financing with a bank, you need to go notwithstanding that the province requires you to have building permits regardless. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson. Any other questions, uh, Stevie? Councillor McNeil, no? So the uh, just to refresh again, uh, we have the actual um, motion and it reads, and again, thank you, John, for providing that. I'm going to read it here because we have it here as well, that the Council of the Municipality of County Victoria in accordance with Section 49.1c, uh, subsection 2 of the Municipal Government Act, Act which states 49.1, the Council may make policy setting and amending fees to be paid for inspection required or conducted pursuant to the bylaw, the municipality or enactment, adopt the attached fee structure effective July 1st, 2022. So this, uh, these, this fee structure, as John has indicated, has already been approved by the Eastern District Board. And uh, in order for um, them to be completed and put into use, uh, it re he requires a, that motion to be approved at this council meeting or at, by this council. So are we prepared to approve that tonight or make that motion tonight? Thank you, Deputy Warden. Do we have a seconder for that? Seconded by Councillor McNeil. Any further discussion on the motion? All in favor? Contrary minded. Motion is carried. Thank you, John. And uh, those fees will be advertised, et cetera, on your website, and the changes will be. Yeah. When the prices go up, usually the news goes out fairly quick. So, and the fee structure is in the minutes as well. So, and uh, thank you, John, and uh, safe travels back to Port Hawkesbury. So, our second item at council tonight we have Jerry Eisner, a GA Eisner water rate uh, presentation. Of the uh, of our water utilities, the four that are operate currently operating in the municipality. So we'll just give you a minute to get set up there, Jerry. Please.
So again, just to remind those while we're waiting, it's for the four utilities that we do operate. So. It is now, green I got the green light. light. Okay. Um, yeah, let's bring that over here a bit. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll use this instead. First of all, just so you know, the last rate study was done actually in 2016, was submitted to the board then. The last rate increase for the water customers was in April 1st, 2019. So it's been three and a half years. Now, during the last um, study, the, the utility had a significant operating deficit. And I mean significant, $2 million plus. Um, it just worked out to your convenience that you were also paying down a major debt halfway through that rate study. And so what the board agreed to do was just simply not let the rates change and just take the money that had been going to the bank and take it to pay down your deficit, which was working really well until uh, the Neal's Harbor Water Treatment Plant came by, <laughs> which kind of frigged that up a bit on us. Um, but you actually took the deficit from $2.1 million to just slightly over a million dollars in those years since that rate study was done, which is a pretty incredible feat to do that and not have anyone see a rate increase. Okay, so just so you know that. So that's, that's a little background. The, the other thing I wanted to go over was that the reason I'm here is because uh, the water rates in Nova Scotia are regulated. They're regulated under the Public Utilities Act. And that regulator is the Utility and Review Board. And so they, they give Leanne and, and, um, and Alex a, a manual of how to keep the records. So they give us a guidance on how to set up the rate study. So this is, these rate studies are pretty universal. Okay. Um, what happens now is that after you have to agree to submit to the board, nothing happens until you do. You, in essence, are the board of directors of the water utility. The utility is 100% owned by the by the municipality, and the municipality's board of governors is runs the water utility. So you're you are the board of governors of, of the water utility de facto. They don't refer to you as that, but I, I do because I, I come out of the private sector, and I think when big guys vote, that's it. Yeah, okay, so that's the direction. That's the policy direction that has to go. Um, what'll happen after we go through that process? You assume you make the assumption to go ahead with it. The UARB will take over. We'll make a submission to them with documents. We'll copy everybody here and it'll all go through the formal processes. And there'll be papers that Leanne has to execute and sign and send originals in and all the rest of it. Um, so they'll take over all the timing. They will then issue, they'll take a, put a, what they call an analyst on the job. They will go through it with a fine tooth comb. They'll ask between 100 to 200 questions. Okay. And everyone says, why? I've answered the same question. I don't, I would guess at least 150 times because I've done a couple of hundred rate studies. <laughs> um, so they do that because it makes the hearing much shorter because the written questions come out, the written answers go in. All of this gets published on the website, their website. So there are this completely open process. The public can read it. You can read it. Anyone can look at it. And during that process, they will they'll put an ad in the paper. They'll invite people to either, if they feel they're being hard done by, they can file what they call intervener status, which means that you have the right to be represented at the hearing. You have the right to ask questions. You have the right to submit questions and all the rest of it. You're, you're an active participant if you're an intervener. Um, and then the public is also invited just to send any submissions they want in. And if they wish to speak, there is a process for that too. They have to put their name in, I think about a week in advance. And uh, someone says, why? I, I had a hearing once where it kind of broke down into a he shed, the she shed <laughs> across the floor uh, in a community. And I think it was more to do with something other than the water rate study. It was some other thing that had happened in the community, but we had two sides and they decided they would hold the, the, the battle at the hearing and the uh, UARB said, never again will that happen. So we'll, <laughs> we'll get you to line up ahead of time and speak. Anyway, when that happens, they take over, they set the timing, they set the agenda. We have nothing more to, I, I follow it, but I don't get any say in it. I can't, I, all I can say is, well, if they pick a date for the hearing and same as you can hear, you can say, no, the room isn't available. We're not available. That's not a good date. It's something going on in the community move it to another date. That's, that's one choice we get. Anyway, with that, then I'm gonna just go into this and I'm gonna 
try to get this most working. If I can figure out how that goes. Uh, I would, yes. But, but the, the very first thing we do is I draw everybody's attention to this chart, which is called, um, it's on page seven. If, if I had to put page numbers on, it would have been seven. <laughs> But basically what this, this schedule does is it takes all of your expenses and projects them for the next three years, but it takes all of your revenue at your existing rates. So it's a test to see whether or not you in fact need a water rate hearing, okay? And we have to fill this out every time and we have to refer to it as a, uh, there, I got it going now. So we, we take all those expenses, we project them forward, go into that, we work with staff, get budgets, and then we look at inflating those budgets over time. Uh, we look at how much borrowing we're going to need. And, uh, and we look at um, where that's going to end up at. And I will eventually find a spot for this, I presume. Uh, I'm going to work together for a minute. Anyway, in your case, if you go up three lines from the bottom right down here, um, what happens is that this current year is right here where the arrow is. And it appears that you're going to make, you're going to have $144,000 to the good. That's that old loan being paid off coming to an end. Then we borrow for a water treatment plant. And the, as they say, the bottom falls out of it. So uh, uh, it, it falls into an $84,000 deficit to a $202,000 deficit to a $294,000 deficit. So we need a rate increase. That's basically what the bottom line is that we need to do that rate increase. Now, unfortunately as well, the board has a thing about when you run a deficit that the deficit has to be paid off in what they call a reasonable amount of time. And they refer to this as intergenerational equity. And that's where some, you run up a bill, but you leave it for your grandchildren to pay for. And they say, uh-uh, uh, if you run up the deficit, then within the next few years, you gotta pay that back. The general rule is five to seven years. So we have five to seven years, we still have a million dollar deficit. So we got to chisel away at that million dollars over the next five to seven years. So in here, you'll find that I put a line in right here, uh, the $30,000 line um, right where the arrow is. And that's actually what's called earnings, which I have no expenses for. So that should flow to the bottom line, which should go against your deficit. If all the accounts and everything work out, then there should be a $30,000 surplus followed by $100,000 surplus followed by $175,000 surplus. And those surpluses will then go down and, and take the deficit away. And I, you know, as, as the owner of the utility, the deficit is yours. So it's, it's not like somebody else's. It, it belongs to the utility, it belongs to the utility customers. And like I said, we, we get basically the grace to go from five to seven years to pay them back. So we've built that into the rate study. Uh, the reason it's so low in the first year is because rates were going up anyway. So I purposely pulled it way down. Uh, it just made, a, a, I mean, $30,000 on a million dollar deficit. It's not gonna make a big dent in it, but at least it shows good faith that we've done something uh, towards paying it off. So that's what's there. Uh, there's no doubt that you qualify for needing a rate study. Like I said, you, you're, you're right now, you, hopefully you end up at the end of this year when your financial statements are done with a, a $900,000 debt. And if that's the case, then we can chisel that down. And within a few years, we can get rid of that, which means we get rid of the $175,000 expense, which means that rates will sit still for quite a while. Okay, providing we don't run up some new debts. So that's, that's that part of it. How we do the, um, the uh, budgets is we work with staff. There's a sheet in here called Worksheet 2ABC, um, which is on page nine. And it, it comes through and we work getting a budget that's a good budget for the current year. Then generally what happens is that we work from that at around a 3% increase, which is what we've experienced now. Right now we're seeing some higher inflation, but we're carrying three on this one as a reasonable thing that we hope we can settle in on. Now, in your case, there were some fairly uh, significant adjustments in what had been previously budgeted and what was being budgeted now. And when I met with staff, they said, look, the previous budgets were perhaps copied from the previous year. And so whatever happened the previous year, they started 10 years ago and things have just kind of tripled down along and no one actually looked at, 
or it doesn't appear that people look seriously at what the costs were actually incurred in that, in that sector. So we break them down and then we go through. Now, the good news is that when, when it's all done and said, is that there's the first year's got a bit of an adjustment in it, but after that, uh, it was a, you know, all expenses with them, depreciation was 18% the first year, 5% the second year, 2% the final year. So it's, it's, it just has to get that ironing out. Now the 18, if you think back about the $30,000, hence the $30,000, because expenses had to go up a lot. So I drove the earnings way down to, to allow that to happen. So that's how the expenses are done. It is a detailed sheet. It's something we have historically, because um, my background's in engineering. When I say we, I have a partner who is an accountant, a CPA, CA, and he actually was the director of finance for Halifax Water for 25 years. And, uh, and I did a lot of work for him over the years as an engineer. We've, we've been friends for a long time. So we, we often come in and challenge staff about expenses. We'll say, are you sure you got enough money in here? It doesn't look like enough to us. We see everybody's REITs in the province. Uh, so it's always a, a good session. Uh, <laughs> and I think it was, uh, it was worthwhile on this one. If I looked up to see Leanne there, it, it really caused people to go back and think and say, yeah, maybe, we're not, maybe we haven't got that number right. Because from our point of view, if, if you're not spending money on some things, and we just look at it and say, look, this just doesn't line up. You know, it's a big item. And you have a tough utility. I mean, you've got really a whole bunch of small utilities, which are formed into one. So if they're not contiguous. You can't walk down the street and get to one. You have to drive a long ways. You have to have lots of small little works departments. In essence, you have to be able to repair something and Neil's Harbor this morning and somewhere else this afternoon. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not simple. And I, I recognize that. Uh, and I think the board recognizes it too. So the next thing we do after that, after we do the expenses, is we look at your capital spending. This is the, the year that was over last year. This is the water treatment plant at Neil's Harbor. Uh, we look at how much money you have in your depreciation fund because you were building up a depreciation fund. You had about $580,000 in it. We figured you at the end of last year, you should have about 740, uh, somewhere in that range. And then we look at what you plan on spending for the next three years. And so we look, there's a, a, a reservoir in there or a tower, a water tower in there for Dingwall. Uh, there's a number of other items, a generator and some, uh, some there's a truck, I see that. And, uh, and water meters being replaced, which, has to happen because water meters are like people. As we get older, we go slower. So <laughs> and I can bear witness to that. <laughs> and, and what happens is when they go slower, you give away water for free. Okay, so <laughs> there's no, it's just, just that simple. The water meter doesn't turn every time and uh, it just it just simply gets a little, little I, I call it scuzzy on the inside because there's nicer terms. But anyway, we, we looked at taking quite a bit of depreciation. So down here, we've taken the depreciation fund down to $116,000 and that's $700,000 it was. That's to avoid borrowing and the depreciation fund is there for that purpose. And we do the same thing each year and we sort of table it down again to 57,000. That's about as low as I'd like to go with it. And uh, so there we pop it back up in the final year to uh, 296,000. So I, th I think it's healthy. I don't think it's, it's a push. I think even at 57,000, you're safe in the sense that you could still do something unforeseen and, and cover your costs. So that's the depreciation. Next thing we look at is the first draw on a water utility is always the fire protection. So the first thing we do is pay for fire protection, which is an expense that the municipality sends the money over to the utility. Uh, to do that, we it isn't random, believe it or not. Uh, although people say to me, it must be, because uh, it seems to change all the time. But we actually take all the utility, the, the plant and service that you have. And I tell everybody the, the two best examples is that uh, a water meter is like zero useful when you're fighting a fire. So we give a 0% and a fire hydrant does nothing to give water to a customer. So it's 100% to fire and we take everything else and we divvy it up accordingly. Uh, mostly, most times we have a, what's called a 40-60 split because pipes in the street are generally 40% for delivering water, 60% for fighting fires. In your case, the board ruled two hearings ago that that should be 50-50 because there were a number of your smaller utilities where fire protection was not quite adequate. 
So they, they put that on there and I have no reason to change it. So I'm just carrying that forward again. So with that, then we calculate on the worksheet C1, what the fire protection rate will be. Right now, the municipality is paying $275,829 a year for fire protection. Um, it calculates out that in the final test year that we did here, it comes out to 26707. The board will let us, with your good graces, uh, charge that same amount, the third year rate for the first two years. The effect of that is it lowers the cost to the customer because there's more money coming in from fire protection. And so that's what we've done in this rate study. We've said that you're already getting a, a small break from what you're spending right now. We said you should continue with the 267 every year and we'll ask the board to, uh, to make an adjustment in the, in the hearing to, uh, to accommodate that. They've done it routinely with other utilities for the very same purpose of keeping customer rates a little more in line with, uh, with what we'd like to see them. So that's... So Jerry, can I just make a comment there? Um, when he's talking fire protection here, that's not to the fire departments. That is um, from the county to the water utility to service the fire departments for water and for right. having pipes there. It's so, for hydrants yes. in, in your systems, yeah. basically what it is. And for part of that new reservoir at, at, uh, that you're going to put in Dingwall. Right. A portion so, of that reservoir, a large portion of that, you know, at least 50% of it is for fighting fires. It's not for delivering water. I, I grew up old school. I remember one of my first engineers, a senior engineer looked at me, believe it or not, there were people older than me. Uh, and, and he looked at me and he says, Jerry, it's a third, a third, a third. He said, you can do all your math because I was fresh out of school doing lots of math. And uh, he said, it'll come out a third, a third, a third. Well, the board actually uses 40, 60. So it's, and the third, a third, a third, by the way, was a third of it's for fire, for uh, delivering water, a third of it's for standing storage, and a third was for fire protection. Okay, so uh, anyway, those were the old rules, but the board uses a, a, normally a 60-40, but in your case, 50-50 split. So 50% of the, of the pipes in the ground, the, those things like that. And they do let us use 10% of the, of the water treatment plants and things like that, because the water treatment plant's still working when the fire's on, it's still making water. And uh, so you, it's not that it's not useful, it is useful. So with that, we take out the fire protection rate, and then with the balance of it, we split between what's called the base charge, which is your quarterly fixed charge, and your commodity charge. Uh, in your case, we again, we, we work with the board on this, we work with staff, we try to uh, set it up such that you don't become totally dependent on selling water, and you also um, don't become, uh, you, you give people an incentive to conserve. Okay, so in your case, it's around 35% of the residual will come from your base charge and the rest will come from commodities. So people have the right, they can change their bill. If they change their habits, they can change how much their water bill is. And, and you know, I, I always jokingly say that if you do that, the people, when they say the water bill is high, the first thing they should do usually is look around the house for drippy taps, look outside for faucets running and uh, look for toilets that constantly run and become a white noise in the house and no one even knows it because they will run your water bill up and they will run it up fairly dramatically. Um, I have firsthand experience. I went away for six weeks, a couple, three years ago. I thought my water bill was going to be really low this quarter. I got back and it was exactly the same as the year before. Guess who had a leaky toilet? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it hits everybody. Uh, you know, I should know better, but I didn't. I didn't hear it coming and I didn't see it coming, but there it was. And it all it took was one water bill and I thought something's off here. So that's what we do with those. Then we look at the number of customers you had. Last time around, you had 508 customers. This time you got 535. I don't know whether that's because you've done better record keeping or whether you've actually had an increase in new customers. Um, but it's a, it's a small growth, but it's... Yeah, sometimes I find that with some of the systems, the, the record keeping and some of the previous things was not always totally accurate. Anyway, uh, we take that and we know how much money we're going to get from the base charge. The, we use a little formula that's been developed by the waterworks industry. And what they do is they take the amount of water you can put through a meter, okay? So a 5 8 inch meter, which is a standard residential meter, they've assigned the number one to. Just a, just a unit one. 
if you take a six inch meter, you can actually put 50 times as much water through it and still get an accurate reading. So guess what? The base charge for people with a six inch meter is 50 times what it would be for a five eighth inch meter. It's that simple, okay? <laughs> and if you have a two inch meter, it's eight times. Okay, so it's, it's not, there's no magic in it. There's no illusion in it. It's just simply, it, it's the same as what Nova Scotia Power does. If you have a 100 amp service or if you have a 500 amp service, you'll pay for the 500 amp service, even if you don't use it. it they, it's because you have the ability to take the water. And that's what's the same here. You have the ability to take electricity you have the ability to take water. So we use the same sort of technique for this. Uh, so that gives us base rates for everybody. Then the last thing, of course, is we just look at how much water you sold uh, and where it's at. Uh, in your case, of course, sales were dramatically influenced by COVID. Uh, so we had to look back over some records and try to figure out, especially with the park and with the Hadinganish, as to what was happening there. We worked with staff. We think we've come up with what are probably slightly conservative estimates, but being uh, liberal and running out of money three years from now doesn't do much good for anybody. So uh, it's better to be a little conservative on these things. So we've done that and we think you're going to sell around 90,000 cubic meters a year uh, to customers. And yeah, I, I did. I always check to see whether your, your residential customers are using any more or any less. And in fact, they're using a, a slightly less um, each year, around 1% less, which is getting to be quite common because if you've been around at all, you realize you can't buy a 13 liter flush toilet. You can't even buy a six liter anymore, they're telling me. Now there's like 4.2 liters or 4.5 liter flush toilets that are gonna take over the marketplace. So all of that does influence the amount of water that you sell to each customer. Um, so with that, we built in this rate study, we actually built in a 1% decline for your residential customers and their consumption for the next three years, because we think it will continue. Um, and some of it is choice. Some of it is if your automatic washer breaks and you buy a new one, the old uh, top loading Kenmore's took 30 gallons of water to use. The new ones take nine. Okay. So now I have my colleague's wife who says that's because you have to wash all the clothes twice because the new washers aren't near as good as my old Kenmore was. So, <laughs> so we do that. And then what we do is we work up a table of what we call every treats. And uh, it's right here. Uh, and on that, we calculate what the average, what the impact will be on the average customer. So we don't look for any single customer. We simply take the amount of water you sold to all the 5 8 inch customers and divide it by the number of 5 8 inch customers. In your case, you have approximately 500 customers. You sold about 50,000 gallons or 50, yeah, 50,000 cubic meters to them, thereabouts. And so we just work out what the average consumption is, which is 24.42 cubic meters a quarter. And we say here, if you were had that in the past, you would have spent uh, $202.83. With the new rate, you'll spend $232.93, which is a 14% increase. Not the rate of increase I'd like to see, but it's the one that we're dealt with. And to be honest with you, we've done everything we can to get it down. We cut the earnings down. We took the fire protection up. We, we pushed everything as much as, as we felt the board would let us push it uh, without becoming, we're not allowed to run a deficit. So we have to always break even. So it, you're pretty constrained by that. Like I said, we pushed some things around as best we could. That's followed by a 15%, followed by a 10%. Finally, in the third year, uh, it's starting to get uh, into a much better position. And I think, and I encourage you to look at your year in statements as they come up. And if you're getting there, uh, we normally have enough built in to get you a fourth year out of it. But during that first, fourth year, if it looks doubtful at all, go back for another rate study. It's far easier to go in front of the board and far easier to go in front of your residents and say, it's gonna be a three and a half percent increase or a 4% increase than it is a 10% or a 14%. And it, there's, there's no fun in it for anybody. Uh, you know, Certainly no fun at a hearing when people stand up and say, what are you doing? You're, you're killing me by putting the rates up so much. So don't, don't set each year and think, oh, I still got money. You know, I'm still making a little money. Okay, making a little means that next year you're probably going to lose a little, and at that point you're, you're toast. You're you're in the wrong side of the curve, and and but you know doing one of these it's a minimum of six months. So once you find out you're losing money, 
it'll, you'll lose another six months or so before we can ever get you rates, even if we get everything working to the best advantage. The last thing was there's a whole set of schedules that go with it, what you charge people for things. I can tell you none of them are changing any of the rates for like turning water on, turning water off, doing things like that. Nothing is changing. The only thing that we added to your whole thing at all was down in the, you have a schedule of uh, rates and, or rules and regulations. Uh, and I'm not even sure that one is new. I don't think it is for you. No, it's not. There's nothing new. So they were exactly the same as they were in your existing rules and regulations. They're the same ones that are approved right now that this that uh, the system is running on. The rules and regs are essentially the bylaws that run the uh, the give staff direction. Of, you know, when someone comes in and says, I want something or I want this, they just go to the rules and regulations and it says, here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. Okay, that's it, Mr. Chairman. I do apologize for the no page number, but I thank Steph for giving me the card. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry. It's a lot of information for sure. And we. Yeah, uh, certainly I'm open to questions. I mean, yeah, no, and, and I think we will. Uh, we uh, we have the four utilities, so in there in four different districts. So yeah. I'm sure particularly interested uh, those councillors that have the, the individual utilities, I'm sure are interested in and asking you a few questions. So we'll open up. Anybody have any questions for uh, Deputy Warden Daphne, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So just a question in regards to the bylaws and the regulations and stuff. And uh, I'm not sure if it's you or if it's the actual utility review board. If, if it's somebody it. questioning the, the the wording of the of the bylaw, it goes to the UARB normally. Okay. But I can give you my thoughts on it if that's yeah. of any use to you. But uh, yeah. it, there is an appeal process that that is set up. If anyone has a complaint and they feel that you're not treating them fairly, oh, okay. they can they can send a letter to the UARB and there'll be an investigation held. There always is. Okay. As soon as they get a letter, they they investigate it. it you know, it may seem trivial, it may seem whatever, but they will do an investigation okay. and they will make a ruling. And if the ruling, you know, is one thing about them is if they feel that the customer is just simply wrong and asking for things that are wrong, they will just simply come out and say, we're sorry. Perfect. Uh, but you know, the rules are this uh, and we're, we're doing it this way, I'm sorry. Okay. The, the, the issue I'm having is um, basically if you're on one side of the highway, the, the cap trail, uh, and you're on the side, it's the thousand dollars to get hooked up to But if you happen to be on the other side of the cabot trail, you have to do the directional drilling underneath, which could be six, yep. seven thousand dollars. Yeah. So I have one incident in my district right now where the guy says it's, it's crazy. He said, I'm not going to pay, it's going to be almost eight thousand dollars by the time he puts it yeah. in. And so he, he, that's his question now. That was number one, was that they would have to do directional drilling. So he wasn't happy with that. But then the other thing is, there is a line that goes across his property to his house that's next door to him. Um, so he wanted to actually tap into that line, put another valve on it. Uh, again, the regulations say you're not allowed to do no, that. So no. is there any way of changing that or is that something that's written? Uh, I, I can tell you it's some areas have taken and decided that they're going to gamble on the price of putting the laterals in. And they simply say all laterals will cost $3,000 or 3,500, whatever, whatever half the price is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Going under the highway, being on the right side of the highway. Um, your situation is very much similar to what happened in Tatama Bush because they're on Route 6 mm -hmm. and they had exactly the same ruling from the Department of Transportation who said, you can't cut our asphalt, we're sorry. Uh, we're not going to have the bump bump, thanks yeah. to you. Uh, so what they did is they implemented a, a flat fee mm -hmm. and it didn't matter which side of the road you're on. It simply said that when the lateral goes in and it normally says the utility will put it in at no charge, but what they've done there is they, they just simply said, everybody pays, I think it was $3,500. And I, I, I thought of it when, when your chap was here with the bylaws about people making all the applications because there was a vote, the area councillor for that area actually went around and told people that we were, we were changing it. And so we had like nine new customers before it changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. because nobody wanted to pay the new fee. The old fee was like $800 and, and it didn't cover the cost. So, uh, but that's one way around it is to look at, at putting so, in it. But to do that, you're saying to be the same no matter what side of your highway on. So yeah, it would not matter which side you're on. Then you have a flat fee. Yeah. And what you've really done is split it between two sides of the highway. Yeah. 
you said if, if you're on the near side, you know, you, you, instead of getting the cheap hookup on the far side, you yeah. so yeah. half of them would be happy with it, and the other half are not going to be happy with it. Well, <laughs> paying, paying more. I, I didn't say I had a great solution. Yeah. I just said I had one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, okay. Well, that that answers my question. I guess the other thing is, and I know other councils have brought it up, is people still are objecting to the thousand dollar fee to hook up. Um, right. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. Well, I, I think that was just to try to offset some of your costs. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, if you don't put it there, then we simply have to raise the price of the water. Uh, okay. It's a pretty simple, like I said, we're not allowed to run a deficit in a water utility. Mm -hmm. You can't run a deficit. Exactly. Okay. Oh, so, Jerry, in your experience, how much normally, or what's the average cost to actually do a connection? If it's uh, in the case where they have to drill under the highway, it, it does get expensive. Um, but I've most of the ones that we work with are, are you know, a lot of them use the thousand dollars as just sort of a place setter and they take the chance on it. They say, we'll, we'll drill under the road if we have to. Uh, but some others certainly have come back and said, look, this is just getting out of hand. We've got six applications. It's going to be $35,000 or $30,000 to put those in. Um, so they've simply come back and said, you know, we're going to, uh, we're going to up the ante, we're going to up the fee. And uh, the board, all you have to do is demonstrate cost to the board. And you have to say, this is, here's how much it costs for the short one. Here's how much it costs for the long one. And here's the average of the two. And that's what we'd like to charge. I think what council is asking is to go make it go from thousand to zero. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, taking it to zero is going to raise your expenses and just raise the price of water for everybody. Okay. You have to appreciate that there's only one customer benefits from that lateral. Okay. It, it's, it's not something that's universal. I'd like, I, I don't encourage that kind of thing because, you know, if you go to the user pay concept, you know, if, if you're getting a new lateral, you know, whether you like it or not, the price of your property probably goes up slightly because you now have central water where before you had a well that was probably dubious or you wouldn't be looking at hooking onto central water in the first place. Um, and the idea of putting two on one pipe is always dangerous because you have to have curb stops and they have to be, basically in front of your property. And, and the only possible way to do that would be to try to get that curb stop exactly on the survey marker, uh, which would be a, a feat from somebody's, because if it ends up on one or the other, then technically you have to cross the private property to get to the next one. And without a curb stop, you have no control over turning the water off if you get a vagrant customer which has been known to happen on occasion. Okay. But, it, but if you if you had a lateral come that was already going down to a house next door and you're hooking into that, wouldn't you add, put a valve? Or a but you have, to get a, you have to get from there to your property somewhere uh, on, on, a, on a piece of land that you have control over. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and if it breaks or there's a, well, I don't, I don't know. I suppose you could try it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I've never seen anyone try it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's just in this case, they're already going across this guy's land to get to the next door neighbor. Yeah. There's no easement for it. So that's what his question is. How can you, how did you go across my land in the first place? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's those yeah. historical things that people just did. Yeah. Uh, and technically, if he wanted to say no more, he, yeah. he, he could dig it up. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, that's the, the ultimate tool that he has because his property, uh, yeah. you know. I, I, I guess my thinking is that we may, one of our problems is we just don't have enough users to I know. pay for the system. <laughs> I know you don't. No, so I'm trying to think of ways to increase the number of users and the thousand dollars or the six or seven thousand to do with it. yeah. it's the deterrent that people are saying, no, I'll keep it my own well. And, uh, and if again, you I don't know a, what if the take up would be. thought you are going to have a lot of them there, like you're going to have five or six that would hook onto it, you could maybe run a, a larger diameter pipe across and run a smaller diameter pipe on the opposite side of the road, they would all be your pipes that would be distribution pipes, but you could exactly. run like a four inch or something uh, and do that. And literally would have a distribution pipe on both sides of the road then, as opposed to one side. Yes. Okay. Uh, but it, it does get tricky and I, I, I know what, I know your dilemma. I don't, yeah. I don't know an answer for it. Okay. That's, okay. That's terrible. No, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, Councilor McNeil, did you have a question, please? Make sure your mic is on, please. Yeah, thank you, Warden, and thank you for the presentation. No problem. <laughs> uh, no, there's a couple of questions. With that $1,000 fee, too, with the existing stops, though, we don't charge that, right? 
uh, that, that's that's what came out of the last like we had a yeah we i think we refunded exactly, because we, we were charging people for, yeah for paying for an existing yes. stop so so that'll help so you're not brought. charging an hour you well not, not for existing stops oh okay no okay i can see that yeah I, yeah yeah, yeah, because it was a fixed fee. You had to, you, yeah. We include the fixed fee of a thousand. Like I said, I've seen exactly. them up to three thousand no. five hundred. I think it went back to the utility board, and they said, "No, we shouldn't. We yeah. shouldn't be doing that." Yeah, for, yeah. They're, for like I said, they're. I mean, people get antsy with the board, but I mean, they are really quite a fair group. And all yeah. they do is just look at the rules and say, "What's the fair answer here?" Um, in the hearings, you know, even though they're a bit stuffy at times, they they actually are just sort of what I call semi-judicial, like we have to get affirmed as a witness and things like that. But it's not like, you know, there's people there with stuffy shirts on yeah. and, and, and acting snooty. So I say, so they're much friendlier than that. And if, if one of you wanted to come in and speak to the board, just make sure you register ahead of time and you'd be more than welcome to. Uh, do you, do you all have, too often we have hearings and no one shows up. Do you have an idea when this hearing will be? No, I, they'll, they'll get back to, the end with uh, with a whole bunch of uh, dates. They'll give four or five dates, and they'll say, you know, pick these or two or three. They ask her, they ask us, and they say, make sure the building is available, make sure that this works, and uh, that there isn't something going on in the community um, that would interfere with that. But the step prior to that would be that council has to approve. Oh yeah, no, you have to. It has to go into. It has to be in their hands before they take hold of it. Uh, up until then, it's it's just a document. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have any, this has no meaning with the board. Once it's filed, it'll be filed as a rate study. It'll be given what they call a matter number, which is just a unique filing number. And um, then suddenly, you know, that becomes the driver. Yeah, but they will consider maybe like individual presenting. Like, oh, absolutely. Exactly. They, they, they have absolutely no problem whatsoever. Like they encourage people to write letters, do what they want. Sometimes, you know, we get, we get some very meaningful letters I've read, and we also get some that are, you know, a little, a little different. But, yeah. uh, but uh, just they simply want people to participate in the process. Yeah, yeah. There's just a couple, and maybe this isn't the time, but just a couple of questions about like, the expenses and everything. Uh, and I just quickly uh, that worksheet two A two B two C uh, for salaries. Uh, it jumps up quite a bit. Kind of, like uh, you explained this before, but I know people will be asking. Yeah. That. So it jumps up quite a bit in the 21, 22, like it goes from 27 yeah. to 114,000 and then back down to 65,000 after that. That was admin salaries. Yeah, that's in administration salaries. Like it, it goes up like on a no, four fourfold <laughs> there to, yeah. from 27 to 114. I think we I asked you that question at the time. Oh, I thought of my laptop. <laughs> yeah, that one was for that jump this year. What's that? So there's a new allocation where there's more staff that are allocated to the water utility for their time that is spent on the water utility, which was not done in the past. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I, above all else, I, the board, one thing they do push for is to make sure that the, that the utility is paying its fair share and not more than its fair share. Yeah. Okay, because it's some municipal units have kind of treated it as a way to get extra revenue and others have been just the opposite where they have. No, I, I don't, just have, jumped I don't have a note on that one at yeah, all. Just in mind. So I, I, I have to leave that one with you, Leanne. Yeah, and I'll have to leave it with Alex. It, it's so. a non-rate year. Uh, so if you cut it back, it doesn't affect the rate study. We can cut it back and uh, because it's it's an, a non-rate year. It's the final three years of the years we set rates for. Yeah. yeah, so that's not coming into the figures of yeah. yeah. Uh, what it would do is just pay down a little for, for information. For information. Yeah, and uh, you're going to soon have those year-end statements done anyway, and when you do, we can we can then get the exact number. Yep. Yeah, and just another thing on the on the water rates itself, the proposed on the first year they actually go down. 
Oh, it's uh, on the base charge, I think, wasn't it? On the base charge? Yeah. From 111 to 100. Yeah, and I, I pushed it as much as I dared, but I, I didn't, uh, the board will probably be after me on that too, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if they get after me too much, I'll have to change it. I, I didn't want you to get too little revenue coming in from your base charge. Yeah. And that was the push down on that, because the, the think, fear is that if, if you lose a few customers, or if you lose some sales, exactly, yeah. it, then, yeah. then you're a lot of in a deficit in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I normally work my way through those and, and try to reach what I think is the balance that's best works and on that one there. But the commodity charge, that would be the, the meter charge? That's the meter charge, yeah. So that, that's your consumption charge. That goes up quite a bit. That goes yeah. up 14%. Is yeah. Is that, is that what goes up for? It, it goes up 40% the first 40, year 40, and, yeah. the, and the base goes down. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then the next year it's 13 and 16.9. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But it makes an overall 14.8% increase yeah. that year. Okay. Yeah. It, it basically, the way the, the formula works, it tries to value the water that you're delivering. And what it says is that right now the water is undervalued. Like you should be charging more for the water. Okay. <laughs> okay. Period. And probably because you're spending quite a bit of money on treatment and treatment plants, and that'll drive it up every time. Uh, because the, those are expensive puppies to get and operate. Councilor, uh, Deputy Warden. No. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was part of questions that we've already answered to the UARB in the, over the last couple of months, actually, two to three months ago, um, when we put in, uh, uh, when we got a decision from the UARB related to that. And no, we're not expecting the costs are going to go down, but it's required by the Department of Environment. Yeah. I just going to say, I, I don't, based on my own personal experience, I, I don't see the price of treated water going down anytime because if anything, we're treating for more things every year. Um, yeah, the latest thing that, that's hitting the southern part of the province is these algae blooms, which they're getting because the water's getting too warm. And so and none of the treatment plants in Nova Scotia are designed to handle algae blooms. So when those start happening, they're gonna have to rebuild a whole lot of treatment plants in a hurry. Uh, Any other, uh, Councilor McDonald? I guess thanks, Jerry, for the presentation. Lots of uh, numbers there to be looking over it to, uh, to reiterate what Councilor Deputy Warden Daphne stated. I had a gentleman in my area that just moved from Ontario and he inquired about, in, about getting the directional drilling under the road. He's on the opposite side of the main line. And he was quoted upwards of 15,000. And his question to me was that if the Dingwall Road is slated to be paved this year, the tender process is supposed to be coming in soon, who does he appeal his decision to? Department transportation, you can work through the municipality, but transportation drives whether or not you auger under the road. Uh, it's not the UARB, they own the bloody road. Okay. And it depends, I hate to say it, but it probably depends on the divisional engineer because some of them are quite reasonable and some of them can be a little tough-minded at times yeah because he was like, okay like the road's actually theirs it's not it's ours he was okay with the taking care of it for us the thousand dollar hookup fee he was all right with that he just he couldn't understand the, the yeah, astronomical no, if cost I, the road was getting ready to be repaid i can't understand it either to be honest yeah. my first reaction is he could dig that they could have paid extra to make sure it was super well compacted no different than they do on the the major arterial roads when they repave and put new culverts in um and do away with having a, a bump there in the future. If it was paved last year, I can understand the department getting a little antsy. Correct. But if it's up for paving, I, I would, if that's the case, I would definitely get a hold of him and have him contact the department and work with him and try to get the department to understand, look, this is this is important to the whole community and and you're gonna repave the road anyway. Just tell us what you wanna do and, uh, with refilling the, the ditch, not just dump the earth in and drive away but actually put in proper soil and compact it in small lifts and make sure it's as strong as the, uh, the rather road, maybe stronger than the old road, who knows? Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. We good? Um, just a couple of quick questions for you. I, I'll ask both my questions in one. Okay. Um, just in regards to some of the information you referenced, you, you've said that uh, the rates are, 
or, or a little higher than you'd like to see. So I guess question number one would be, what would you consider, what rates do you like to see of increase? I, I like to see single digits. Single personally, digits, yeah. okay. Personally, I, I don't like to see a double digit rate increase. Okay. I, I mean, it, it, I tell everybody, I, I, the worst one I've ever done, I think was a 70% increase. Wow. Yeah, and that was a utility that had been neglected and has now got a new owner because the town is dissolved. But, right. Uh, that was pretty rough hearing. Yeah. I, I um, mean, you, you can't do anything about that. I mean, you can't dress that up no matter what you say. I mean, 15%, you can talk about the amount of money that's involved. And, you know, that, that brings it down to something a little more real. Because believe it or not, I'm antsy enough that I look at that every time. Now it's $30 in a quarter. So we're talking, you know, 90 days and $30. Uh, so it's not as, it's not embarrassingly high. It's not what I would like, but it, yeah. you know, we're talking you know, six to 40 cents a day or something. Right. And I, I agree and with you. It's, it's a valuable commodity. That's it, it is the most undervalued of everything we sell. I, I mean, most people pay far more for a, a friggin' cell phone yeah. or cable TV than they ever think of paying for water. I mean, this is, you know, you're talking about selling water for $232 a quarter. That's, you know, a hundred, about $70, $80 a, a month. You know, what monthly bill do you, you're, I don't know about you, but the cable TV at my place is more than that. The internet bill is more than that. My cell phone is definitely more than that. <laughs> so the, the other part of it too, just as we end up here, you know, we know and we've heard many, many times, it's, the smaller you are, the more expensive it is. Yeah. It's, it, that's just the reality. And unfortunately, we have four small utilities, but, we, small ones but we need, together. are they, even with the new prices, are they comparable to other small, similar? Uh, you're, you're, the, the, the most expensive water, I think, still in the province, and I don't know if I said that cheap, is still Mahone Bay. Right. Okay. And they're slightly above you, even with the, the new rates. Um, their problem is that the raw water that they start with, with the color of that table, and this one over here, the oh, brown nice. one, where the water jug is setting or the speaker is setting. Yes, yeah, speaker. Yeah, 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 because they're they're in an area where it's very high in what they call tannins, which is the color that's in tea. Uh, so it's it's dead vegetation, and it's really expensive to get that out of water. It's just a very expensive process if you have that yellow water and swamp water, whatever you want to call it, uh, it is really expensive to treat that. Well, um, on behalf of council, I want to thank you very much for the extensive uh, report that oh, you no, did do. You're more than welcome. And, uh, you know, as far as council is concerned, we uh, we have to approve the rate study so that it, uh, it uh, will go forward to the UARB. So uh, we've been given the appropriate information this evening and um, we just need a motion to move it forward to the take it to the UARB. Are we in favor of doing that this evening? It doesn't have to be, uh, but it doesn't go forward to the UARB until that happens. Yeah. And we don't have to do it tonight. Uh, I, um, you want more time to take a look at it. Or my question would be if we did approve it tonight, if you have additional questions, would we take them back to you or does it, uh, as you work? So, <laughs> well, what we can do, we meet again in July 12th. So if, if you want, uh, couple of weeks to, to it's a lot of information I agree if you want to go over it and if you have questions uh, in the meantime you can direct them to Mr. Eisner and, uh, and then um, we can put it on as a uh, yeah or to, you can to direct them to Alex, Alex and or Alex, Alex can, yeah. yep mm -hmm. yeah either or yeah. she does okay and that's yeah
understand that completely. Yeah, no, no, no. So we'll just accept the report tonight and then uh, we'll allow a couple of weeks for those that want to go through. It is a lot of information and uh, it's a very comprehensive document. So if you want a couple of weeks, look it over and then we'll deal with it in July 12th and make a motion that either we send it on or if, if that's the decision of council. I want to thank you very much for your your time and uh, thank you very much for the report that you presented this evening. So thank you. All right. I, I got to tell you, it's, it's really good working with these uh, two gentlemen. They're very knowledgeable, very smart, ask good questions. Alex thought you were rock stars. <laughs> 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 the only reason why I asked for more time was the last report, and I missed that thousand dollars for that two days. And then everybody was going to want to deny it. Well, the other thing is that during the raid hearing, your mic's keeping to your hands. In the raid hearing, we will undoubtedly come across some things that the board will want us to change, and they will we'll refile it one more time. And that'll be what finally gets to be the decision. Uh, and it, it'll probably be a tweak that's very minor, like less than a dollar on a quarterly bill. But the board is very thorough. And if they go through it and find something that they find that they don't agree with, it can be in either direction, I'll warn you. <laughs> so they can, they can raise rates too. Um, but they, uh, they're they very thorough and they go through it. And then the obligation is on us, Blaine and I, to to refile the, the, the corrected document as part of the hearing process. And uh, like I said, it, it, we've refiled them for as little as probably 25, 30 cents on a quarterly bill. So uh, so there's no such thing in the, this world as, as the accountants say, not material. <laughs> Everything is material <laughs> when you're dealing with the utility review board. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, again, we appreciate the report. We can tell it was done by an engineer just by the volume and the detail. So, so we, uh, we are going <laughs> no problem. Uh, we're going to uh, take a uh, 15 minute recess and we'll reconvene at approximately quarter to seven.
All right, welcome back to uh, this evening's council meeting. Next item on our agenda is uh, we have circulated the minutes of council meeting on May 30th. They have been circulated to you. Were there any errors or omissions in those minutes? If hearing none, do we have a motion to accept and approve the minutes of May 30th, 2022? I make a motion to approve the minutes as uh, written. It's been moved by Councillor Longla. Thank you that the minutes be approved as circulated. Do we have a seconder, please? Second. Second by Councillor McDonald. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion is carried. I'm going to move on to the CAO's report. Okay, thank you. So a few things that are uh, items from prior councils. Um, related regards to the Inganish land survey, uh, the PID has now been updated. So now back to the surveyor to see about the next steps. There's a bit of difference in land shapes that um, we found in the title search. So uh, work is starting or is, is progressing on that. Um, we have completed our accessibility advisory committee, boundary review and local improvement chart bylaw open house sessions. Uh, we completed them last a week and a half ago, something like that. Uh, thanks to everyone that came out. Um, uh, we are investigating solar panels at our facilities. So um, we're looking into some quotes on that. Uh, and interestingly enough, quotes have increased, probably they've probably tripled over the last three years. So um, just an, a reminder for everyone, upland planning sessions are scheduled for June 27th to the 30th around the, uh, around the county, encouraging everyone, residents to attend these, to have your say. It's related to minimum planning standards uh, around the areas outside of Bedeck that are not planned. So uh, please get out and have your say related to that. Um, we've received a response from Brett McDougall at NSHA related to having town halls. Uh, NSHA has committed to having town halls um, being held the first week of July, and as we get more information on when they are going to be held, we'll be passing it on to you folks and to also uh, we'll be promoting them as well. Um, the school bursaries that we mentioned at the last council have been mailed out, and I've also reached out to Mayor Chisholm Beaton regarding the offshore wind project, and she'll be coming to council in the near future. So just a couple of things related. Oh, so also the RFP is out for the sale and purchase of properties on our behalf. Uh, we had a meeting related to properties that we own, uh, land that we own that we want to, uh, that we have a surplus that we are looking to um, uh, divest of. And then we're, we're also looking to purchase a couple of properties based on some meetings that we've had also. So we're looking for uh, a realtor that can help us with those types of things. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. So just some updates from our department heads that we have here. Um, all of you should know that our tax bills were sent out this week. You should have received them in the mail. If you haven't, please contact uh, the tax department. If you don't have it by next week, uh, please contact the tax department. Uh, tax bills are due August 1st of this year. Uh, our water rate presentation has um, been presented here earlier today which uh, we'll bring back up on July 12th. And if you have any questions, please email them to Alex or uh, Jerry. Um, also, our tax sale happened June 21st uh, at 2 p.m. I uh, wanna give a little update on that. So the tax sale was held at the Inverary Inn on uh, June 21st, which was Tuesday. There were 24 properties on the list to start with. 21 of those properties sold a tax sale. 46 properties started on the tax sale list. Uh, that means that they were in arrears from years um, 1999 to 2019. Uh, eight properties were removed from the sale because they were paid ahead of time. 14 properties were removed um, and deferred to the next tax sale. Uh, there was just a couple of things and we just weren't comfortable putting them up there yet. Um, we also, uh, collected in taxes as of selling those 21 properties. So three properties didn't sell, but of the 21 that we sold, we collected 146,000 in taxes that were outstanding. 
And we also collected surplus on that of $565,000. It was a very exciting, interesting tax sale. The tax department did a fabulous job. So I wanna pass out or I wanna uh, congratulate them on that. So that's in our finance department. In recreation and active living. So Lydia has been working on placemaking. She was down north today to meet with Dingwall on the green space. Um, she also met with uh, Anganish Development relating the Cops Cove space and wants me to announce that on July 5th, uh, the three groups, the IDS, the Parks, and the municipality will be hosting a barbecue at that location to propose placemaking ideas, and all are welcome at that. Um, in North Bay, there will be a North Bay beach cleanup on June 30th. Um, all are welcome to attend. And she's working on some initiatives with the trash formers trucks for a cleanup around the areas. Um, her Dalem Lake walk has been promoted on Facebook and on social media. There's a good following that has been going to that. Uh, she's also recognized the volunteer recognition nominees and the promotion is being done online also. So thank you to all of our volunteers around the county. In our tourism department. So Dan has been busy. Uh, Dan has been working with Inganesh looking at the STEP program for some long-term community planning. And STEP stands for Sustainable Tourism Expansion Program. Um, he's met with BABTA and BABTA is having a problem there currently have a lack of employees, which means a lack of hours at the visitor information center, which also means a lack of hours at our bathroom. So it's a real concern. So they're looking at trying to find some solutions related to that, but it's a, it is a real problem. Um, he's also been working with Destination Cape Breton for on a downtown music series and expecting to have downtown music um, sessions happening in Inganish and in Badak. This last week finalized the festivals and events funding program with Destination Cape Breton, and they will be awarded this week. So festivals will be hearing if they have been successful. Um, had a meeting with Bedeck Waterfront, and they're looking to revitalize the trail work on the island. Uh, unfortunately, it's not looking good for ferry and beach services over there this year. I think there's a lack of lifeguards. Uh, he's been working on some steps for a Bedeck comprehensive community planning initiative. And a bit of an update on trails, uh, trails work. So actually, um, Dan and Lydia walked on our new spot that is being developed um, beyond the transfer station today. Uh, and they came back feeling really good. So it's looking really good over there. So um, encourage anyone who is interested to get out and have a walk. I'm, I'm not sure if it's open just yet, but it will be very soon. Um, but it's, it, it's starting to come together and feel really good about um, making some progress. But uh, related to trails, the area report is now complete. Uh, they have found three areas of low to moderate Mi'kmaq impact, which is not directly on the trail route, but we're looking for next steps related to that. And then also, hopefully, as there's more of these that are being asked for, we're looking to see if we can put together a procedural uh, checklist from them of what it is that they're looking for and what you do when you, uh, what the next steps are. So that's something that we're hoping to work with on the province. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back on the act of transportation funding. Uh, the Mary Barker Trail is also requiring an area assessment. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming that they'll be in touch with Dan about uh, some helpful steps related to that. Um, the trails grant approval letters will be going out soon. Also our grants that we've discussed um, at prior budget meetings, um, those grants uh, went in the mail today. So uh, successful um, organizations should be getting those checks. Uh, Dan's also done a review of trail bridges inventory system, and there's probably 26 bridges on the um, spots that we have been that we've mapped out 26 for consideration for varying degrees of repair or replacement. Um, so there, there is work to be done on some of the trails that are actually there so that's a it's a good thing that we have this other trails um, fund in place as well. In public works. So Kelly was down, she took our communications person on a tour of the facilities and the potential new location down um, for the new transfer station north of Smoky. And we'll be working on having some public information sessions down that way on what the proposal looks like. Um, Kelly wanted me to or let everyone know that Friday's waste collection will be collected on Wednesday, June 29th due to the Canada Day holiday happening on Friday. Uh, we also have a tender out for a C&D hall. 
So the quote for that uh, haul, which means hauling from Dingwall back to here, the our C and D product that's down there. The quote is uh, $60,000. And part of that, once it gets hauled here, the back haul takes um, wood chips for dealing with um, the fish plant waste. And that is a cost of $14,000 for those wood chips. So it is a costly adventure. Uh, we've closed a tender on a new side loader. It's gonna come in, uh, the tender came in at approximately $400,000. Um, our new intern that uh, is working over with Public Works, uh, Maddie. Maddie's been working on some projects um, and she's been cleaning up the website. She also, you're gonna see this over in the next little bit, uh, she's put together some Gaelic signs for our waste bins uh, and our sorting bins for various locations around the county. So if you see some words that you might understand or you might not understand, they're uh, the Gaelic uh, interpretation of uh, organics, uh, the garbage and recycling. Um, we're also looking at innovative ways to dispose of cigarette butts. So cigarette butts are a problem um, and we're trying to find a way to find, um, to encourage people to put them into a spot that is suitable for them so that they can not be left on the ground. Uh, our hazardous waste event, was unsuccessful. There was 30 people that dropped off waste. The cost of that could be up to $50,000. So I don't know if it's something that we're going to do very often. I'm not recommending that we do it very often. Um, we should, everyone tried their best to promote it. Um, but yeah, 30 people showed up for that. Um, there was a water line repair that was done on Ocean View Drive in Neils Harbor. It went really well. It's complete. We're waiting on good weather window to, uh, uh, for once we get it, once we get the good weather window, we'll be scheduling paving crew to pave the repaired section on Ocean View, as well as a section of the Dingwall Road where, where we performed another uh, water break repair a few weeks ago. And um, okay, so that is Public Works. In economic development, uh, Erica has been busy. She's been working on a Bedeck housing and labor survey. It's live now. Currently, there was 23 businesses that have responded so far. She's working on a housing project in Inganish with the Inganish Fire Department. Uh, she's having ongoing meetings with a developer regarding opportunities in Inganish. Uh, she's encouraging businesses to connect with her and the partnership to learn more about immigration and how it can assist with staffing needs long term. She wants to mention that it's been exciting to see businesses providing unique housing solutions for their businesses. Uh, she said she's been speaking with Highlands Hostel and they've just purchased cabins for their staff that uh, the cabins arrived on the weekend. So uh, innovative ideas down there, that's great. Um, she's been on the road more meeting with businesses and working on business plans. It's nice to see businesses opening for the season. She met with uh, the Whistler Economic Development Officer also met with economic development in Collingwood where Blue Mountain is, other areas that are sort of um, uh, adventure locations. She's also met with Summerside PEI to learn more about their incentive programs related to housing and what they do to try and find solutions for housing on uh, seasonal issues. Uh, so trying to gather some information, see if any of those solutions would work here. She also attended the Mountain Bike Atlantic Mountain Biking Summit in New Brunswick, said it was very interesting for that project that she's working on. Uh, so a couple of other things. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be having two community information sessions for the proposed North Transfer Station. Uh, so stay tuned for the dates on those. We're wanting to get those done or maybe uh, early July related to those. Uh, Bell has contacted us that they have updated um, some areas and completed in Ganesh fiber op. So Larry, you should be having better internet down there now. Uh, this year we've included the village tax bills on our bill this year. Uh, so uh, we're working with the village related to that. Uh, last weekend, I, or no, uh, last week during the week, um, I attended a, the AMAN's um, CAO session and board meeting. And then I went to visit a washroom down in Lunenburg. Uh, so there's a sea can that is down there that has been put out of commission. Um, 
we are actively looking at this sea can, which has been converted into two washrooms, an office and a shower. And um, we're looking to see if we can find a forever home for it here. It looks like it might be less costly. We're working with Develop Nova Scotia um, to see about getting it and getting it shipped here. Um, so we're, we're looking for a place to put that. Um, we have signed the contract related to the new smart meter installation related to the water utility, which uh, Jerry was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, and I had a meeting uh, about the new arena with uh, members of that committee about the municipal offices moving there. Uh, I know we've talked about it several times, but I don't know if we have it in a motion anywhere. So uh, we've had several discussions related to this building, the assessment of this building, um, what the future is for administration offices. So I'm hoping we could maybe get a motion on the books so that we have something to um, have council go or have administration go forward with. So I've, I'm not sure if you want to have a few words before I. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, for. All right, the, the, the condition of this building has been on our radar and in our minutes since 2019. And as a result of concerns about the condition of the building, we asked uh, for an RFP to have an assessment done on the building. That assessment was done in November, 2020, uh, 2021. Uh, we had uh, the consultant come back in February on Zoom meeting open to the public to discuss his findings. We also invited him to come to the chambers here, open to the public in March. So um, we are now discussing the three options that they gave us out of that report. So I think that the motion tonight is to, to consider the recommendations from that report. And the recommendation, or I'm sorry, the motion, I'll let Leanne read it and it's for consideration tonight's council. Yeah, so I, I believe there should be a motion to instruct administration to investigate options for the future of administrative offices, including uh, rental of, a, of an administrative space, renovation of this old building to continue, uh, or construction of a new building, um, and investigate options for the future of the current building that we occupy. So that is the wording of the motion and also uh, both those reports are here. They are here for anybody that wants to view them. They're also available online and they have been online. So um, we've been very clear and upfront about our intentions and uh, trying to move forward because the consultant at the end of the day, as council may recall, gave us a functional lifespan as a municipal public building for three to five years. So, and we also are, uh, need to address whether we could be compliant with the regulations for accessibility in 2030. So we've done our due diligence on this and is anyone prepared to make that motion this evening? I'll make that a motion. That's been moved by Councillor McNeil. Do we have a seconder please? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded? Motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Great. I have one more thing that came from district planning. Um, this is a road name change petition form. Um, it has been signed by uh, several members. It is over in, I believe, it, it is off the Cabot Trail. It's in District 8, past White Point Road, South Harbor. Um, the house, there's three houses on the road, three signatures here. They are requesting that the road be changed from an unnamed, unnamed private lane to uh, their first choice is Big David's Lane, and the second choice of a new road name is David's Lane. So I, I think I need a motion to go forward with that to uh, send that along to have that road name changed. Right, there is no the road name prior to was it a number just a civic or there was none it says it's an unnamed road unnamed private lane yeah. so it will stay as a private lane it will just be named familiar with that but i make a motion to that effect that be sent to uh district planning 
It's been moved by Councilor McDonald. We have a second for the name change, please. Yeah, I'll second. Deputy Warden Daphne, all in favor? Contrary minded. Motion is carried, and we will forward the correspondence to the appropriate authority. And that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions or comments for the CAO? Uh, yes, Councillor Longa. I just wondered if there's a place in Cape Breton where people can bring their hazardous waste. So unfortunately not. Um, that was what this, this was for. We are looking to see if we can build one possibly at the new uh, transfer station that we are putting in. Um, but currently uh, CBRM possibly, but there's nowhere else. Um, and so we brought in a contractor to do this mm -hmm. because um, because there was an ask related to it, um, but it, it didn't go over as well as we thought that it would. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deputy Warden. Uh, just in regards to that, to the end, I, I guess the biggest complaint I heard was that for North, it was Sunday morning between eight and 12. A uh, number of people were interested, but when it came to Sunday morning, it just was not a good time to do it. So I, yeah. I don't know if we can do something in the future, but if we could do something at the new depot would be excellent. So um, the logistics of having that down was was the reason for the timing that it was. Um, and the cost was only going to increase if you kept them longer. So we tried to get it as, we tried to reduce the cost as much as we could. Um, so unfortunately it was Sunday morning, but it, it, logistically it was the only thing that would work for that and cost efficiency. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Any other questions or comments for the CAO? Thank you very much. Then we're going to move on to the next item on uh, the agenda and we're going to do district concerns and we'll start with Councillor McDonald, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Warren. I just have to uh, bring up my notes because I have my public works concerns first. Okay. Uh, apologize for that. Yes, I, I think there's only one main concern this evening was that with, uh, was it was around uh, cell service and namely in Bay St. Lawrence area. I've had people probably well over a month now that have had no cell service or there of lack of in between drop calls, no service whatsoever. And especially with uh, seniors in the area. I actually had a lady that reached out from Councilor Oregon's district yesterday. And she said the same is happening in that area, namely in the village of Smeltbrook. So I called a bell myself and I was given a ticket number along with probably 30 other residents from St. Mary's Village, Bay St. Lawrence area that uh, it's basically just, if I can use the word, a runaround. They're getting a ticket, <clears throat> a ticket's being issued and then they're just being told that it's a tower upgrade and this has been gone, going on too long and I've had uh, quite a few people with concern namely is for emergency services because there's a lot of seniors in the area and, and families like that have cell phones and if they're not able to make a 911 call then what's the purpose of having either service so i'm not sure who do we reach out to if it's bell cellular is that through is that through uh communications because I, I asked our uh, emo and he said the only number that he would have would be if someone is for uh, if the tower itself actually went down so i was given a number by bell canada after a 45 minute wait on the phone for the towers and when i called that number it was all in french and there's no other option so so i can see if i can reach out to different connections and networks and see if i can come up with a number um and I have your I have your concerns here. Do you have it there? Your concern for in front of you. And do you want it there? No, I have it here. Okay. <laughs> um, so I can see if I can reach out and pass on that information and those concerns, and see if we can get anywhere. Problem, you know, the problems are Bell. So because it is the only service provider for that area, and I I just like to make note too that it's only in Bay St. Lawrence these issues are happening. Like over in Cape North in my area, it's good cell service. Mm -hmm. It's just in that that area. Uh, 
I can see if I can reach deep into some old emails and see if I can find someone um, or reach out to other um, uh, other municipalities to see if they have a contact. So, so I have to make a motion in effect of that, or just kind of leave that with you. To I think you just instruct me to do that. Okay. No. <laughs> Oh. Uh, another concern is so much but i just have one other thing i'd like to just pass along that the public access washrooms are now up and running in district eight in both cape north at the north Highlands museum and the bay st lawrence community center both are accessible facilities with 24-hour access i just pass that along as well and we're also working on signage for those great yep and lastly, I would like to uh, make a motion to use $2,000 from my District 8 budget for the following, if I could. Uh, Northern Victoria Community Center in the amount of 500. Bay St. Lawrence Fire Department uh, will be hosting their Crab Festival. They haven't had it since 2019 because of COVID. There'll be $500 for the, them as well. And the Bay St. Lawrence Fishnet Society in Caravan and Buchanan. $1,000 for continuing of the green space initiative that they have been working on since 2018. And that's uh, it for District 8. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Uh, Councillor has made a motion um, taking funds from his district budget. Uh, we have a second to approve that. <clears throat> second. Thank you, Deputy Warden. It's been seconded by the Deputy Warden. All in favor? Contrary minded. The motion is carried. Thank you, Councillor. Anything else? Deputy Warden. Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, the only complaints I've been hearing is really in regards to the Department of Transportation and some erosion that's on Ferry Road and Beach Crossing Road. Uh, Steve's aware, and I'll be following up with him to see what's going on there. Um, the only other thing is uh, ditching. They started to do some ditching in which was great to see, but it only lasted for about a day and then it disappeared. So it didn't go. So we'll be following up with Steve on that also. Um, the only other thing, I was wondering if for next council, Leanna, would be possible to get an update on the washrooms that were proposed for Inganish. There was supposed to be some contracts signed. Uh, I'm wondering if we could just get an update at the next council on that. And that's it for District uh, 6. Thank you for the report from District 6, sir. Do you want me to do Jackie's? Yes, please. Would you do District number 7 in uh, absence of Councilor Oregon tonight? Perfect. Councilor Oregon uh, did pass on some concerns where she's not available tonight. Um, if I can read them here. She did have concerns about a school bus drop off from White Point, and she wanted to pe let people know that she has been in contact with the school board and is working on it. She's also had some complaints in regards to an issue that the RCMP might be involved in, and uh, she's been in contact with the RCMP, and they're looking into it also. Uh, she would also like to make a motion, or I guess I'll make the motion, um, for uh, $500 from District 6, my district, District 7, Councillor Oregon, and District uh, 8, Councillor McDonald, $500 from each district budget to assist with the Meals on Wheels program north of Smoky. So I'll make that a motion. We have a motion from the Deputy Warden. I have a seconder, please. And I'll second that. It's in seconded by uh, Councilor McDonald. All in favor? Aye. I'm to remind it. Motion's carried. Uh, the only other thing Council Oregon would like is she would like to uh, have a $200 uh, check to sponsor a hole for the Lions Club uh, golf tournament being held on July the 10th. So that's a $200 uh, support for the Lions Club. Okay, no motion required for that, but nope. it's captured in the minutes. And that's all for Councillor Organ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Warden. Councillor Longva, anything this evening? Um, yeah, in regard to what uh, Councillor McDonald said about the, ser the cell service, um, I had a constituent in my area that's lost her cell service at her house and she called Bell to inquire and they said that they had been realigning the towers to provide better service, which caused her to lose service. So um, so whoever you contact, you can add my area as well. Um, I had calls on road issues uh, on the new Harris road, there was flooding. Uh, the new bridge and the road at Tarbert Vale, um, the entrances on both sides of the new bridge and the road needs work and flood, flooding issues on the Plaster Mines Road. And I have reported all of those to Steve McDonald. I just want to put it in the minutes. 
Um, I'd like to make, I would like to make motion to ask uh, Nova Scotia Power to have a street light put in at 1140 Tarbot Vale Road. And I did give the form to Steph uh, with all the information on that. Okay, that is a motion from Councillor Longblood. Do we have a seconder, please? Council, I'm sorry, Councillor McNeil has seconded the motion for the street light. Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, all in favor? All right. Contrary mind, motion's carried, sorry. Um, I'd like to make another motion. I move that uh, Victoria County Council write a letter to Eileen Cross, be the chair of the um, Bredore Lake Biosphere, congratulating them on uh, their organization on being renamed again for another 10 years as a biosphere. And that's quite an accomplishment to uh, have that reinstated. It, they look at it every 10 years and now they've, been, they've gotten it for another 10 years. So I would like to make that motion. Thank you. And uh, do we have a seconder for that, please? I'll second that. Seconded by Councilor McDonald, all in favor? I'm to remind it, motion's carried. Thank you for that, it's very important. Uh, and I'd like to also put in the minutes that I have requested to take uh, some money from my district budget, $400 for the North River Riverside Cemetery, 400 for the Goose Cove Cemetery, 300 for the North River War Memorial, and 800 to the North Shore Recreation. Thank you. Those uh, that is form of motion. The, right. I guess it's, don't need a motion because they're all under. Yeah, I know. I was thinking they all add it together. So if, if we're good that they're all under a thousand, we'll let it go and it'll be captured in the minutes. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, if that uh, washroom comes around, we still need some in District Four. Um, and. Someone did contact me. They were a, a snowmobile club from Sydney, but they do a lot of work on the trail in North River. And they said there's a bridge out there. I don't know, is that something that we can contribute money to or? That would be where they would apply through the trails grant. Okay, so, so they can, even though their club is in Sydney, but the trails are out here. So if it's the Cabot Snowmobile Club, they do a lot of work up there. We've yeah. given them money for uh, work in that area. Okay. So yeah, they can contact uh, Dan or Lydia, actually. Uh, Dan says that he's aware of that. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. And that's it for District 4. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate it. Councillor McNeil, anything from uh, District Number 1? No, actually, it's just FYI, uh, the new ferry was dedicated this uh, Tuesday. Uh, there's a big crowd there. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Victoria County wasn't recognized very much uh, in there. So. But uh, also, uh, the, there, I'm getting some complaints about the wait times on the new ferry, too, from uh, some individuals. And uh, I'll contact Steve about that. Uh, there's an issue on the new Glen Road. There's steel coming up through the road uh, in a number of places. So I will be in contact with Steve on that issue. And uh, for future uh, notice that the dedication of Route 223 as Cape Breton Highlanders Memorial Way will be coming up in the near future. So that's it. Thank you. Good. Thank you for your report this evening, Councillor McNeil. Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, could I get an update on the uh, road request, road name request that was made last uh, council meeting? It's gone out to Port Hawkesbury and no, we, nothing come back yet. Okay. Uh, secondly, I don't know if anyone else has this problem, but it's been pointed out to me and I've seen it myself. There are still some places uh, that have heavy garbage that turn to the driveways. Uh, some of them are summer places and I don't want to cast any aspersions, but it, it seems to me they even put it out after May 9th because they thought it was May 30th, which it was in CBRM. But anyway, um, people are noticing it now. And I just, I was talking to Leanne during the break. Uh, I don't know if we can put our heads together some way to get it either removed or taken away or whatever, because it's becoming an eyesore too. That's the other problem. Um, so, Maybe I'll just put it out there and uh, 
It, does anyone else have that issue that was still heavy garbage? Aren't those two okay, great. Uh, you know, maybe we can develop some strategy to uh, get it taken care of. Um, whether we visit the people and ask them to take it back, or they could uh, pay to have it taken away or whatever. I don't know. We'll have to come up with so much, so much, so, some way of doing that to get rid of it. This is something that Jackie actually brought up at the last council session because there were some TVs and some things that were left um, down in her area. Mm -hmm. So she brought it up at council session to remind people that it was over and please to remove, to remove the items. And then I believe she probably contacted them herself to have that uh, removed from there. So you might have some work to do, Councillor. Yeah. No, but it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it happened for whatever reason. And again, you know, I was being kind of facetious of people thinking CBRM, but it, it did happen. And actually, there's one on the Trans Canada Highway. So you may have noticed it. There's a pretty, pretty good look of the mattress there, as a matter of fact. I mean, you know, but anyway, uh, it doesn't present a good uh, image to uh, tourists, especially. So. Anyway, thank you, Leanne, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Um, Councillor McLeod is not here tonight. She had one request. She asked uh, if I would pass on on her behalf. I believe Upland is doing some presentations around the municipalities. I know you referenced this a little earlier, but her request, she had a request from some of the folks in Middle River that uh, would there be a, an opportunity that maybe they might do uh, an open house there, but um it, we just would uh, make the request if it's if it's uh, doable fine if it's not then it's not but yeah, it's, i can try yeah. i can ask them a request but um they have certain times scheduled for this also and this is actually second rounds that we've yeah. asked for but i will put the request out yep and and it was for request yeah. um and just in and in my own district, district number three, you had alluded to earlier about the short staff at the visitor information center. So we would encourage anybody that meets the requirements. I'm not sure if there's two, I want to qualify that. I'm not sure if it's student positions or if it's just general positions, but certainly would encourage anybody that uh, is looking for work to uh, certainly apply for some of those vacancies because it would be, we want to make sure that facility is open and that we have uh, proper staff because that's uh, an entry point to a lot of uh, people coming into Victoria County. Um, the second issue I just want to uh, bring up just very quickly, we had a very successful tax sale here on uh, two, Tuesday, and I, I've never, honestly, I haven't been to a tax sale before, uh, so I went down to take a, uh, uh, as an observer, to take in the proceedings, and I stayed for about 45 minutes, and uh, I just have to echo the comments of, um, the CAO, the the uh, the way that the tax sale was conducted, the professionalism by the staff was uh, remarkable. Really, everything ran well. There were no controversies, and uh, so it. There were a number of employees that were there, and just on behalf of council, I want to recognize uh, the excellent job they did down there, and that includes Alex Redden, Alan Bragg, Kathy McKenzie, Caitlin DeVoe, Lori McCauley and Steph McLeod. And I think we generated a, a significant income that day. And not only for the great job they did that day, but the great job that they're doing in the taxation department. And uh, credit is due strictly to Leanne and her staff and, and council. We want to thank them very much for the amount of time and the professionals they exhibited doing that, uh, doing that tax sale. So well done to everybody from council. Um, the only other thing that I have is a proclamation. I could do it under, do we have any other correspondence? Yeah, or we have motions, that could be a motion. Yeah, it, it is, uh, would need a motion for the following proclamation. Whereas the municipality of County Victoria has adopted the principles of openness, transparency, and accountability, whereas the Municipal Government Act gives citizens the right of access to information in the custody under the control of the municipality of the county of Victoria, and whereas access information ensures citizens of Nova Scotia have the opportunity for meaningful participation in the democratic process, and whereas celebration of the right of citizens to access information will facilitate informed public participation in policy formulation, ensure fairness in government decision making, and permit the 
airing of reconciliation and divergent views. Whereas the County of Victoria joins all other Can Canadian jurisdictions and democracies worldwide in acknowledging International Right to Know Week. Therefore, it being resolved that I, Bruce, Warden Bruce Mars and Municipality County Victoria do hereby proclaim September 26 to August 2nd, 2022, uh, I'm sorry, October 2nd, 2022, to the Right to Know Week in the Municipality of Victoria. So do you have a, a motion to proclaim make, that proclamation? I make that motion to proclaim that proclamation. Thank you very much, Councillor. And do we have a seconder for that, please? Second. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Thank you very much. The motion is approved. The proclamation has been completed. So we have correspondence. Any correspondence? All correspondence has been sent out. And all correspondence that has been requested to be mailed has been mailed. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to the last second last item uh, is other and meeting schedule. Yeah, so, so uh, we, we discussed this. Um, ideally, what will happen on days when there is council session that we will be having some meetings beforehand to make the days flow smoother. Um, so uh, ideally we will be scheduling one to two, one to two to three meetings on those days. Um, if there are, or if there are meetings that, uh, are requested to be had on other days, um, we're hoping to use the, uh, virtual reality that we are living in now and having zoom sessions for any of those. Great. And just keep in mind, everybody's got a busy schedule for different reasons. And uh, we've just run into, so we can kind of condense our schedule or condense our meetings, have them on the same days. And we're going to go with quorums because if not, we've, we've run into already, we've had to reschedule, reschedule, reschedule. So just, I, I'm just asking and including myself that if you make every effort to try to keep the time free for those uh, uh, dates and, and particularly the days of the meeting and we can work around schedules sometimes if it just about the timing of the, of, of the meetings but for the most part we're going to schedule in advance and we're going to schedule multiple meetings on the same day so that it's more cost effective and it's more efficient from an administration point of view and it's a lot easier for staff too if we have those meetings uh, are you, are is council in in favor with that uh, I'm in favor to a degree, with, but I think, uh, from my point of view, uh, I remember them all. Uh, can we get reminders of the meetings two, three, one day before? Like the, the last week, the housing meeting and the uh, there was two meetings scheduled. We were supposed to have a council meeting, and that was postponed. And then we had a two others scheduled. I swear, I checked my calendar and I didn't see them. And I didn't know about them until one of them had started. So I think we have to develop a system because we're having more and more meetings and it's really hard to juggle and keep track of them all, especially when you have, uh, if you have medical appointments, you, you can't call up and change those just because you feel like it or whatever. So I think we have to look at the whole thing, this being part of it, and a more efficient way of communicating to us when the meetings are. Yeah, and uh, we haven't had a, a lot of complications as far as meetings. It's mostly just trying to find a day that that everybody is available. You know, the medical stuff that that kind of happens outside. Just yeah. like so, yeah, we'll take that into consideration. The other thing too, Councillor, points well brought up that we just changed our email system and our email addresses. So there's been a few glitches that way too. But moving forward, and in, in, in principle, um, you know, we can't say that this is going to work 100%, 100% of the time. But if we can agree in principle that we will combine our meetings on on a, uh, a day where we're having council and uh, we try to improve the efficiency of our of our own governance. So has everyone contacted David to have their email migrated and their email opened? And because you were sending your email from your emails today came from your old email address? I'm still getting both actually. Right, uh, but your highly your your old ones are you're gonna still get those, but you're encouraged to use the new system. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm a, yeah. Yeah. So you were sending from the old system today, so the email that you sent out this after this morning 
I'm not sure if it reached all council because that counselor's that email is no longer. That's right. Yeah. Right. Councilor McNeil, the wizard that he is, <laughs> help me out with that. So I've got that change. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. yeah. Great. Uh, so uh, just a reminder, you do have to accept the calendar invite for it to show up in your email also, or in your calendar. The, the email will, but it'll show in your calendar. So if you need some help in looking at the calendar, we can show you that also, because your calendar can be set up to show you the week and what the week looks like. So we can, we can, we can do that. Yeah. Uh, question, just uh, we're handing out our business card still has the old email address on it. Should that be changed or? Yeah, we're gonna have to update those. Yeah. Thank you. I think we were waiting for everybody to be migrated so we could do one mass ask of the of the business cards as well just another question on that on that item how long will our uh, old email addresses be forwarded to the new it's not gonna last forever i'm sure i think david said that that will happen that will last forever sorry it will last forever oh really oh, yep okay. but you're encouraged to um you're encouraged to your new, your new email address yes mm -hmm. And the new email addresses are on the website, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Yep. So we try to get to that consistency to the new. Um, all right, so we're, we're good with that. And uh, we will, uh, if you need more advance or notice, uh, we'll try to set up a schedule so that you'll get uh, those notices a couple of times in advance of the meeting, or if indeed they may be canceled or changed, so. All right, the next item up for uh, uh, under other was travel policy and I'll turn it over to the CAO. Yeah, so I sent you a copy of the um, updated travel policy. So we had a meeting where we talked about the travel policy and some decisions to be made. Uh, there's one piece that uh, we were asked to investigate, which was the diff or which was um, reimbursable and uh, travel allowance. Um, that is still outstanding, but we thought we would do a new trial and we can keep amending the policy, but the only change on this policy uh, as of this, as of today, uh, from the policy that we had prior was the mileage rate. So uh, we also had a discussion at budget sessions where we discussed that we would follow the provincial rate. So uh, to get that uh, approved as of right now, uh, that's the only change that's in this from the prior one that we had. Um, but if you want a new mileage rate that agrees with the provincial rate, which gets adjusted uh, based on how the provincial one gets um, gets adjusted, uh, we'll need a motion on that. So does anybody have any questions before we ask yeah, for a motion just, to accept? Uh, two things. The, the metrage process that we follow now is just the status quo. Right? That's not changing. The, the what, sorry? The metrage rate, we're... we're dealing with now the kilometers traveled but the under eight is not changing correct okay that is still it could, could i just add one thing and, and this won't happen very so, often sorry sorry your mileage rate is changing well, yes it's yeah, going with the, to the provincial rate. rate yes um just just on uh mileage at the end or message and <clears throat> this can't happen um for example if uh, a person drives from Bedeck to Toronto, uh, that's roughly 4,000 kilometers return, uh, they would, they could submit a claim for $2,000. No. Okay, that's my question again, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. it's the different, it, it would be the lesser of the, the, the flight or the kilometer of the Is mileage rate. Here? Uh, if it's not, uh, I'm sure I had that in here when I originally wrote it. If it's not in here, that will be put in here. That's what should yeah. be. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. that's, what yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. If that's not in there, that, that needs to be in yeah. there. And, you, uh, and with that, you'd need approval from the CAO warden or deputy warden. So it hopefully would be captured there as well. Yes. If, if you were uh, yeah. right. So correct. So, yeah. yeah. That, Trust me, that would not be a, that would not be a <laughs> You're not going to get by those three. I'll tell you that. Um, so, do we have a motion to accept the, uh, the municipal travel expense policy and with the noted addition that Leanne's going to add a vote 
the, the less cost of the two modes of travel. I'll make that a motion to accept. That's been moved by the deputy warden. Do we have a seconder, please? I second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Uh, motion is carried. Um, proposed draft publication minutes. Thank you. Uh, interesting, we had that proclamation uh, earlier. Uh, I, I just sent this out uh, this morning. It's uh, a bit revised from the last version. And I, I think what I'd like to do is make a notice of motion to uh, address it the next council meeting. So everyone has a chance to look at it and do that. So a notice of motion to uh, discuss the um, publication of council committee and committee reports on the website. So. Okay. Um, we'll have a notice of motion, Fraser or deputy. Councillor Patterson has indicated there will be a, you will have a notice of motion um, for next council meeting for a proposed draft publication of minutes. Yeah. Okay, we don't need a motion for that. You're just advising us that you are going to be, going to have presented. Yeah. Yep. Um, is there any other issues to come to council tonight? Yes, sir, Deputy Warden. Just a quick one. I was asked by the warden to fill in uh, for a meeting with the Cape Breton Music uh, Cooperative, and I was able to attend and very interesting. Uh, they will be coming to council with a presentation in the near future, but I just want to let everyone know that uh, they've got some great things on the go. The Hall of Fame, Music Hall of Fame for Cape Breton, but also very concerned about uh, music in schools and where our future is for music in Cape Breton. So really looking forward to their presentation, and I believe Steph, they'll be in contact uh, at some date to uh, arrange a, a schedule to come in. So just want to bring everyone up to date on that. Thank you. Very good. Thanks for that. And thanks for attending that meeting. Uh, was there any? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is just for the next meeting. But um, when we were away on that conference that we were at, and we saw that exciting composter, which I can't believe yes. you didn't bring up. Yes, yes, we were excited. About you that. brought it up. I've oh, seen yeah. It. I've seen it. And brought it in as soon as I came home. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but we can talk about it. I mean, we when we saw it there, we were excited because they have big commercial ones, and we wondered if that would be a way to deal with fish awful stuff or not. Yep. But something to discuss at the next meeting. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up. It did, and I'm not going into great detail. It's better we bring in the, uh, the, uh, the information that we picked up there, but the the, the three of us that were there, four of us that were there, we visited a booth and it's uh, it's really something we think could be relevant here, small and, and large like for schools. And I think it's addressed the smaller amount of organics that we produce in this municipality. So I think it may be a good option. So anyway, I, I did give the information to Leanne and we are gonna take a look at it at the next public works meeting. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, anything else to come to council? Our next meeting is July 12th. It's at 5 p.m. just on summer evening hours. Housing and a review of our municipal boundary review. And you'll be getting multiple notices for those you, meetings. You have, you've received notices. You should have them in your calendar right now. Your motion. Yes. They should be in your new calendar. <laughs> so Fraser, they're in your new calendar with your new email. They're not there until he accepts them. I'm, I'm sure he's up to date. He's done everything right. I know he, he has. Yeah. Um, were there any questions uh, online tonight? Uh, there are no questions, but there are a couple of comments that cellular service is bad in the entire municipality. Multiple locations. We yes. do recognize that and we strive to try to get the providers to improve it. We have a motion to uh, adjourn council this evening. Moved by Councillor McNeil to adjourn. We are adjourned.